Last week, we began our focus on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount by considering the upside down values he wants his followers to embody in order that we can truly be representative of his by being salt so that we can add God's seasoning and being his light so that God color can be added to our world, a world that is in need of both, rather than simply adding to the noise by living by the world's standards. Jesus' message would have stood in stark contrast to the crowd's understanding of how the world worked and what the Messiah had come to do. They expected a revolutionary, which he was, but one who would defeat the oppressors and would work to see the Jewish nation living with autonomy as a nation. The Messiah's reign for them would begin with battle, blood and death, or at the very least, the eviction of all foreigners. But Jesus made it clear that if those were their expectations, they were going to be sorely disappointed. His was a call to peaceful revolution. The revolution that Jesus intended to lead was one of personal, national, and worldwide transformation of human hearts. His greatest desire was to make a way for humankind to once again enjoy a relationship with God and to know God's blessing. Many people would have been confused by Jesus. They're trying to sort out, who is this guy? Is he the Messiah? Is he going to usher in God's kingdom on earth now? What had he come to do? But I suspect that his answers must have baffled the majority of them. So when we continue through the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to begin again at Matthew 5, verse 17. And here's his very clear answer. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose to fulfill them. Now, the crowds must have scratched their heads at this answer. Who said anything about abolishing God's law? That certainly wasn't what they were expecting. The law was what set the Jewish people apart from everyone else. And what did Jesus mean by saying that he had fulfilled it? Doesn't fulfilling or accomplishing something mean that you could now dispose of it? Like when the house or car payments are done, so the mortgage loan is no more and the paperwork can be shredded or, or burned. What was this guy talking about? To Jesus' audience, he may have appeared to be contradicting himself. It's not abolished, and yet it's fulfilled. We may very well ask ourselves a similar question. What was Jesus up to? You see, he's providing answers to questions they hadn't even thought to ask. He was providing them with information that didn't make sense at that moment, but would one day. Now, 2,000 years later, from our historical vantage point, how would we explain Jesus' meaning that he had come to fulfill the law and the writings of the prophets? Well, I think there's two, le three levels, no apologies, where I believe Jesus fulfilled the law and the writings of the prophets. First off, is his life fulfilled prophecy. He was born in Bethlehem. He came from the region of Nazarene. He rode a donkey into Jerusalem, and he fulfilled prophecy in regards to the nature of the sacrifice. Now, much of Jesus' fulfillment of the ancient prophecies had yet to take place that day on the mountainside and would have appeared as nonsense to the crowd. But we also know that Jesus' life, as the fulfillment of the writings of the prophets, would later make sense to the disciples after his resurrection and return to heaven. How often do we read that after he had returned, they remembered his words and it made sense. It's like Jesus is scattering out puzzle pieces and only at a certain point will he be able to gather them and make sense of the whole picture. Secondly, he lived perfectly according to the law's requirements, fulfilling it personally. We know from a previous study that Jesus often ran amok of the Pharisees and religious teachers because they accused him of breaking God's laws. However, it was not the laws given to Moses otherwise known as the Torah, that Jesus broke, but rather the oral tradition, which were the religious leaders' attempts to explain how to live according to the law in every conceivable instance. So for every law of God, there may be 50 to 100 rules for obeying it. Jesus repeatedly pointed out their imbalance concerning their demand for the strict adherence to their own interpretations of the law, and yet not for God's desire for mercy above sacrifice. 
Jesus fulfilled God's law by living the proper interpretation of it. And he was the first and only person to do so. While we know the truth of his personal fulfillment of the law to live perfectly according to the requirements of God, most in the crowd just saw him as another man, equally susceptible to rule breaking as they themselves were. The third way that Jesus fulfilled the law has to do with the fact that his own personal fulfillment of the law enabled him to meet the requirements as a perfect sacrifice to work on behalf of us. By being a perfect sacrifice for those who are obligated to pay the penalty for breaking it, he could fulfill the law on our behalf as well. Again, this would not have even entered the imaginations of those listening. They had Moses' instructions and the interpretations of the religious teachers. When they sinned by breaking God's laws, they also knew the sacrifices required. A bull for this, a goat for that, a dog for this. They knew the price they had to pay. When Jesus told those listening that he had come to fulfill the law, they could not possibly have grasped the enormity of his statement. He was quite literally telling them that the end of the sacrificial system was quickly coming to an end. But the question remains, if Jesus fulfilled the law, why is it still in force? And this is where we turn to chapter five, beginning at verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, someone who rejects Jesus' fulfillment of the law on their behalf is still required to pay the penalty themselves. This is what he's telling us. The law is still very much in force. The law is to be kept, and there are penalties for not doing so. Jesus didn't abolish the law. He came to fulfill the requirements, and he warned his audience that their obedience to the law would have to surpass the Pharisees and teachers of the law in order to enter into heaven without him. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees were considered the gold standard, standard for compliance to God's law. But Jesus told his audience it wasn't good enough. Long story short, Jesus was telling the crowd that his way really was the only way. Accept his payment or be required to make the payment yourself. But doesn't the Apostle Paul tell us that Jesus' fulfillment of the law gives us freedom? How does this supposed freedom work? Jesus tells us that we're still required to keep the law perfectly if we choose to reject him, yet also are judged on our practice and teaching of it as followers of Christ. We really do need a new understanding of what quote unquote freedom is according to Paul because it doesn't line up with today's concept of being free. Our concept today often boils down to me, myself and I choosing to do and think and act any way I deem best. Well, that's not what Paul's talking about. So if we look at Galatians 5 verse one, Paul writes, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Paul is having to address these Christians who are attempting to reinsert the need to follow the law. And he's trying to convince them that what Jesus did is all that's required. But we have to ask ourselves, is Paul contradicting Jesus here? No. He's challenging people to consider what obeying the law actually should look like. It can't be reduced to circumcision, what you eat, and observing certain days, things that you can do. Our freedom comes from accepting Jesus' payment. Attempting to earn our salvation through observance to the law becomes a form of self-imposed slavery. After experiencing the freedom that comes through a relationship with Jesus, it makes no sense to attempt to do what we cannot by living as though we can. If the law isn't enough to save us, why impose its requirements on us? 
The purpose of the law was to show us how to live in a right relationship with a holy God. But because sin has taken root in the human condition, the law simply reminded us of how dismally short we fall. Paul tells us that as those who accept Jesus' work on our behalf to fulfill the law, we're free from it. He also then tells us that our sin became an opportunity for God's grace to be shown in abundance. And he says in Romans 5.20, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. <laughs> However, he was also quick to correct those who thought their freedom now meant that they could live their lives without restraint, which is, if we're honest, very much the prevailing mindset of our world today. And he says in Romans 6, 1 to 2, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? This new freedom we have is not to be treated selfishly, as some might assume. We have freedom, yet are still to regard another's opinions on the matter, which in our world, where everyone is told they're free to live any way they choose, very much sounds contradictory. When writing the Roman church on the issue of freedom and faithful conviction, Paul argues for consideration of others instead of being critical. Some felt they were free not to observe certain days. Others felt they must. Others felt free to eat, even meat that was sacrificed to idols because it's just meat. Others felt they could not based on its original purpose. But in Romans 14, starting at verse 14, this is what Paul says. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person, it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you're not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your e eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what you eat or drink but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. In short, if my exercise of freedom causes another to some stumble, or another way to call that is to weaken their allegiance to Jesus, I've broken the law, which Jesus told us has not been abolished because I'm not acting in obedience to Jesus' greatest commands on which all of God's laws are based. And what is that? Well, let's remember Matthew 22, 36 to 40, when a teacher of the law specifically asked Jesus, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Jesus said that the two greatest commandments were to love God and others. That in fact, all the commandments and laws stem from these two. And we must remember that even if we break any one of our God's laws, we've broken them all. Jesus fulfilled the law and we are now free from it. Yet we must also live in a way that honors other believers so as not to cause them to weaken their allegiance to Christ. Paul again explains, be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. And that's Romans 12, 10. If I cannot use my freedom in a manner that shows love for God and others, then I must refrain or I will have broken Jesus' commandments to love. As Christ followers, the principle of love is to be what we filter all of our freedom choices through. So what are our takeaways today? I believe the first one is Jesus' life fulfilled the ancient prophecies made about him. And he continues to do so. Many of the prophets spoke, spoke of his final return and rule. It hasn't happened yet, but we know that it will. We can trust that he will continue to fulfill the writings of the prophets until all is accomplished because of the evidence we already possess of things that he has done. Secondly, Jesus fulfilled the law by living in perfect obedience to it. And because of this, he can also fulfill it on our behalf as the perfect sacrifice required for sin. 
Third, those who refuse Jesus' work to fulfill the law on their behalf are still required to obey it perfectly or make the required sacrifice, which is, we know, the eternal separation from God for their disobedience. Fourth, our freedom is not to be used as an excuse to be selfish or to be disobedient. Yes, God forgives us, but only when we repent. Disobedience committed deliberately is not easily repented of because repentance requires sorrow for our actions, not an attitude of entitlement. And finally, as Christ followers, as I've mentioned earlier, the principle of love is what we are to filter all of our freedom choices through. We are to act in a way that builds up others, that grows God's kingdom, that proves we are followers of Christ. And I just want to close with some final words from Galatians 5 on this subject, starting at verse 13. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love, for the whole law can be summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the spirit, you're not under the obligation to the law of Moses. I'm down to verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed their passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives.